Hi again and guys and welcome to the 16th installment of Beards and Cars and for those who are perhaps newer to this series basically what we do here is just have an informal chat about stuff which doesn't necessarily fall into the videos during the week. So it's not tunes, it's not reviews, it's more gaming talk or movie talk or specific car talk in general, or maybe even talking about stuff on YouTube, as we have before. Now, in this particular instalment or episode, I wanted to talk about something which, again, I have touched on before, and I know that many petrol heads have similar interests in this regard, or at the very least have thought of at some point. And of course, as always, I'd love to hear the thoughts of you guys down below in the comments, because I know for a fact that many of you guys have thought about this before. And the subject in particular is dream projects, as far as cars, or maybe even motorbikes go. And I don't just mean tuning a car, or restoring a car, or building a car, because of course plenty of people do that. They build track cars, modify street cars, give it a bit of stance, maybe rat look, wide bodies, need for speed style. That's not really the kind of project that I'm talking about. I mean more ground up productions. Stuff like if you had your own car company, like what would your dream project be if you could put your name in effect on a car, if you could, for instance, make your own supercar, or if you could make your own race car. And as I said, I have talked about stuff like this before, not in beards and cars, but I've made specific videos in the past, such as my Dream Lamar project, where I talked quite in depth about my ideal Lamar prototype, which I would love to create and field in the Garage 56 class in a similar way to the Delta Wing. And incidentally, Panos, who technically designed the Delta Wing to begin with, are also fielding another new Garage 56 vehicle, or they're hoping to at least, they've made the concept, which is currently showing at the Goodwood Festival of Speed as this video goes live. And it's a GT EV prototype, it's got an off-centre asymmetrical cockpit design, and it's, a, I believe, a full EV prototype, fully electric, Maybe some sort of hybrid system, I didn't look in depth into the details. It's an interesting looking machine, it has a very Daytona prototype look to it, with the fake headlights, I think it was, like stickers. It must have headlights, I guess, so maybe that's just the concept version, because of course in the Le Mans you need headlights. But it's a cool looking design, and it's a very aerodynamic looking one as well, which is of course exactly what you want to be as efficient as possible when you're talking battery life, because typically... Batteries aren't going to last as long as a petrol or diesel car's fuel will, and although you could have a system where you swap out the battery pack, if you're pitting in more often to do that, you're still going to lose time. So of course they want to find a way to make the car as efficient as possible, and a large part of that is aerodynamics. Personally, I'm a huge fan of panels. I love the tech that they make. I love the fact that they actually go out and make these crazy off-the-wall cars. And actually, panels overall is my favourite racing team. I love all of their race cars, and I love the fact that Don Panos just uses his cash to create these cool things, like the Esperante in road form, which is one of my favourite sports cars, the GTR1, of course, which is made famous by Gran Turismo predominantly, which I've always loved, the Batmobile of race cars, and incidentally, back in the day, Panos made a hybrid version of that called Sparky, a GTR1 with a hybrid system, before anyone was doing that kind of thing. I think it was back in 1998 or thereabouts. But that aside, that's basically the idea of this episode. What would be your dream project? Or maybe you might have more than one. I know for me personally, I've had dozens of dream projects which I would love to do if I had my own car company. I have multiple different car companies, which I have different names for, like in this dream world. And even if I had the opportunity to actually do them, I probably wouldn't, because the business side of a car company doesn't appeal to me. All that paperwork, all the safety crash tests, all that stuff is just such a huge amount of work. So if I actually had the opportunity to make my dream project, I'd probably do it as a one-off custom vehicle where you don't really need to worry about that side of business as much. Or for instance, have another company collab with me to build it, that kind of thing. Now, I don't want to talk about all of my dream projects, of course, because we don't have that kind of time, and some of them wouldn't be as interesting, but I think two of the biggest concepts which I would love to create as my own dream car project 
are actually totally different. One of them is fairly similar to my Lamar project. There's no point in talking about that again because I already have, and if you're interested in my idea for a Lamar car, I have actually put a clickable link to that video at the end of this video, in the outro. But for now, I'm talking more street level, kind of production ideas, and I think my two primary ones are either a supercar, which is more of a one-off concept, I don't really care about making that a production vehicle, and the other one is actually an idea which I've had for a long time for a traditional mass production company, and what I would love to do if I had a production car company, like a traditional idea of what a car company is. Not a huge one like Ford or Mercedes or something like that, more on the level of... Well, I guess more of a traditional British car company, more of a small, single factory producing cars, not necessarily hand-built, and not even sports cars, which is the traditional small British company, but I'll talk about that one in a second. That's a slightly different idea. But the first one is I would love to make, as many of you guys doubtless would as well, my own supercar. Now, as far as design goes, I would of course design it myself. I have rough design ideas. I don't put too much thought into them because they're never going to happen, so it's not that important. But the essential visual design that I would like to go for would be similar to the B-Engineering Adonis, which is one of my favourite supercars. It has a totally polarising design. Some people love it, some people hate it. It's kind of an either-or vehicle. You can't really be indifferent about that car. You have an opinion either way because the visuals are so oddball. Personally, I love it. It's got a huge windscreen which slopes all the way back totally unique shape. The headlights look like a kind of a fighter jet shape or a, a swift, as in the bird. And the design of the car itself, although reminiscent of the EB110, the Bugatti, which actually shares the engine with, it's still got its own appearance. It actually looks more similar to the EB110 prototype than the EB110 production car. And I love the Adonis. I think it's a great looking vehicle, one of the best looking supercars, I would say, certainly one of the most unique, and one of the rarest. I believe they only built 21 of them, because that was how many carbon fibre tubs they had left after Bugatti liquidated in the 90s, and they used the EB110 production line, including the quad turbo 3.5 litre V12s, to make the Adonis. It's one of the quickest supercars that most people have never heard of. You're looking at just under 230 miles per hour, 720 horsepower, I think it is. Price tag of like 450 grand new, but doubtless they cost a lot more than that now. And I've unfortunately never had the opportunity to see one. I would love to, and I think Goodwood of all places is probably the best chance of seeing one. But having been there, I haven't seen one yet. Now, that would be the kind of design that I would go for. As far as power plant, this is going to come as no surprise to any of you guys, but I'd love to make a gas turbine powered supercar. Because there have been gas turbine powered cars before, the Helmet TX, which I've discussed on the channel, the only gas turbine powered race car to ever have a victory. There's also been others like the Lotus Type 56 Indy car, the STP oil special indie car, I can't remember the full name of that car, but that had like a tandem system where the turbine was next to the driver instead of behind you. The uh, BRM Rover, Lamar gas turbine vehicles from way back in the day, and even stuff like Jay Leno's EcoJet, which has a 650 horsepower Honeywell turbine, I believe, if I remember correctly. So I would love to make a similar vehicle to that, in effect, with turbine power, I'd like to find a turbine which is putting out maybe between, say, 600 and 750 horsepower, somewhere around there. You're also going to be looking at around 800 to 900 foot-pounds of torque, typically, because they have more torque than power, generally speaking. You're looking at a red line of around 60 or 70,000 RPM. Maybe fit it to something like a two- or three-speed automatic, in a similar way to the Y2K motorbike which is, incidentally, my favourite motorbike, also uses gas turbine technology, and it's by far the fastest production motorbike ever made. Now, what I would do that's a little bit different to just a traditional, well, it's not traditional, but just a straight-up simple gas turbine-powered car, is I would like to make it a hybrid. 
but not a hybrid in as much as it's saving fuel and reducing emissions. I mean a hybrid in as much as it has dual power, in a similar way to the LaFerrari or the McLaren P1 or the Porsche 918. But the way I would have it a little bit against what people might expect is the drivetrain. Because typically, a vehicle which is a hybrid, a cross between a traditional motor and an electric motor, would typically have the motor i.e. the petrol burner or the diesel burner, powering the rear wheels, and then the electric motor power in the front, and then have like a regen system. My system would be a little bit different to that, because one of the main problems that a supercar has, or has to overcome, especially supercars which go for really high top-end speed, which is exactly what mine would be, is keeping the car safe at that speed. You've got to have great aerodynamics, great tyres, some form of stable downforce system that doesn't reduce speed, but at the same time keeps you straight and true on the road. And of course I wouldn't presume to think that I could do that perfectly, this is all very theoretical and just for the fun of it, but what I would do to help in that system is I would actually do the exact opposite of what a manufacturer would typically do. And even if that doesn't turn out to be as good, I would still try it because it's different. And what I would do that's different is this. Instead of having the gas turbine powering the rear wheels and then the electric motor giving the front wheels a boost, or maybe all four wheels a boost, what I would do is the exact opposite. I would have the electric motor powering the rear wheels only, and have the gas turbine powering the front wheels so in effect, it would be a front-wheel drive supercar. Now that doesn't sound like a great idea, and as far as cornering goes, it wouldn't necessarily be a good idea. But this is where I would have it slightly different to what a typical front-wheel drive car would be like. Because of course you'd have torque steer, understeer, so how are you going to overcome that? Well, basically, the system that I would have would be, as I said, say a 600 or 700 horsepower turbine mid-mounted behind the driver, as you'd assume, but I'd in effect have it so that the layout of the car is the exact opposite to what the layout of a normal car would be, because, of course, most cars, say performance cars, for instance, would be front-engine, rear-wheel drive. So you've got your engine at the front, drive shaft going to the back, or prop shaft going to the back, and then driving the rear wheels. In my car, it would be the other way around. The engine is in the middle, or the rear middle, technically, with the prop shaft going to the front of the car, and then powering the front wheels. So a schematic of the vehicle would look quite strange. It would be totally the other way around to what you'd expect. In effect, it would be like if a Porsche was front-wheel drive, rear-engine front-wheel drive. It would look kind of weird, but again, totally unique. And what I would do for the back is I'd have something like say for instance a Tesla P100D motor which is putting out something like 540 550 horsepower to the rear motor and slightly less to the front so I'd use one of their rear motors and have that just powering the rear wheels and the way I'd set up the car is that the motor provides you with the vast majority of drive at everything up to say 100 miles per hour so in other words to launch off the line it would basically be a rear wheel drive car but totally through electric power. Because with gas turbines, they take a little while, say three or four seconds, to spool up enough to give you the kind of acceleration that you'd want. Now, three to four seconds in your average supercar is, in other words, your 0 to 60 time, or your 0 to 80 time. So that actually aligns up pretty well, because if you can get a 550 horsepower electric motor to get you up to around 100 miles per hour, that then allows the gas turbine to in effect be just under its own load instead of trying to propel the car to give it enough time to spool up and then by the time the motor kicks out the turbine is in its prime and then from 100 miles per hour up the turbine gives you that immense power that immense torque and that huge relentless shove of acceleration which gas turbines give you because for mid-range and especially top-end acceleration there is nothing that can keep up with a gas turbine now to put this into perspective, the kind of acceleration that you could have, the Y2K motorbike, which I mentioned earlier, and I have talked about this before on the channel, that motorbike, which of course is far lighter than a car, but still only has 320 horsepower, does 0 to 227 miles per hour in 15 seconds. The 0-60 takes about 3.5 to 4 seconds on that bike. 
That's not impressive at all. There are plenty of motorbikes which can beat that, but over a standing mile it can still outrun a jet, because although from 0 to 60 it's sluggish, once you get above that it's untouchably quick. Now in a car, you've got a lot more weight to be carrying. Of course, you're looking at maybe 14, 1500 kilos. Because in my system, although it has an electric motor, I would not have a big heavy battery pack. What I would have is a very small battery pack, maybe a quarter of the size of a Tesla's pack. And the pack would be recharged from the flywheel of the turbine. Because when you've got a turbine spinning up at 50, 60, 70 thousand RPM, and plus they've got a huge amount of torque. And you've got to remember, a gas turbine is designed to lift a helicopter at the end of the day. Or the majority of them are. That is not going to put much of a strain on the turbine, running a battery, or recharging a battery. So the electric motor never really needs to last that long. And as such, the battery doesn't need to be that big, because the turbine can just recharge it in a matter of minutes. So ultimately, the car is a hybrid in terms of performance, but not in terms of fuel economy. I'm not trying to make it fuel efficient. That's a ridiculous notion to try and make a gas turbine fuel efficient. They do about five miles per gallon. So that's just not the point. Now, with that being said, I would have, as I said, the electric motor giving you drive, of course, direct drive, no gears needed, up to about, say, 80 to 100 miles per hour. That wouldn't make you insanely quick, and you've got to remember, although the turbine isn't fully spooled, you're still going to be running some power out of it, so say maybe 100 or 200 horsepower. That means that from 0 to 100, you've got a good, say, 550 horsepower from the motor, and then maybe 100 to 200 from the turbine. That's still 650 to 750 horsepower, which will give you a pretty good 0 to 100 time. Not necessarily world-class leading, but certainly good enough. Then once the turbine kicks in, it becomes, in effect, a front-wheel drive car. But you've got 700 horsepower going to those front wheels. Now, from 0 to 100, that would be a real problem, in a similar way to the Nismo GTR Le Mans car, which just wasn't quick enough through the corners because you can't get the power down. But the thing is, through the corners, my electric motors would be doing the job not the turbine. So through corners, it would in effect be a rear-wheel drive car with only about 5 or 10% of the power coming from the front end at any given time. But then once you get above 100, which by definition could not be through a corner, you'd have to be on a straight, then the motors would kick out and the turbine would take up full drive. Then 100 plus, it would become in effect a front-wheel drive car. And nobody's going to take a corner, or not a significant corner, at above 100 miles per hour. Not in real life. On a game you can, but just not in the real world. So that being said, above 100 miles per hour, it becomes a 700 horsepower front-wheel drive car. Electric motor disengages, because, let's be honest, when the gas turbine is running at full chat, which it would be, the electric motor wouldn't be anything but a hindrance. It would be given a negligible benefit to the car. So, why am I having it that way? Well, some of you guys will already know exactly why I'm doing that, but for those who are unfamiliar with high-performance physics, that kind of stuff, aerodynamic physics, drive, and the advantage of rear-wheel drive, front-wheel drive, all-wheel drive, basically the reason why I would do that is because in a vehicle like, say for instance, an SSC Ultima Aero, or a Koenigsegg, or a Hennessy Venom, those big, extremely powerful rear-wheel drive cars, they're so light. The Hennessy, for instance, has one horsepower per kilo, only weighs 1,200 kilos. At that kind of speed, say 240, 250, 260, you've got very little weight over the front end. So the slightest wrong turn, and that front end is going to go. It will just give out screech off the road, and you'll crash very easily. Plenty of people have done that in supercars for that exact reason. Because, of course, at that kind of speed, you've got such a tiny, relatively speaking, such a tiny amount of grip over the front end, unless you've got a wing on the front, or really great aerodynamics, then that's going to be an issue. With my car, the difference is... Well, actually, the difference can be explained by holding a pencil. If you pick up a pencil and hold the pencil from the nib, in effect, and hold it upright, so you're holding it from the bottom, that represents a rear-wheel drive car. And as you can see from holding that pencil, the top of the pencil, which is the front wheels, is very loose. It can swing around a lot because there's not much control there. With a front-wheel drive car, if you hold the pencil from the top and let it hang underneath your fingers, that's like a front-wheel drive car. 
the control is at the front and the hanging end of the pencil can just swing around, which is like the back end of a front wheel drive car. Then if you hold it in the center, you've got total control over the pencil, which is like an all-wheel drive car, but it doesn't swing at all. It becomes very stiff, just like an all-wheel drive vehicle can be through corners. Now with that being said, at that kind of speed, a rear-wheel drive vehicle is in effect pushing the car down the road. You've got the rear wheels providing drive. When you reverse that, it kind of has the shopping trolley effect, where instead of pushing it, you're pulling the trolley behind you. That's the difference with a front-wheel drive car. The drive is coming from the front, so in effect, the wheels are pulling the car forward instead of pushing the car forward. And that is a huge difference to have, because it means all of your control is coming from the front end, and the back end of the car can be relatively loose, but you'll still have a lot more control and a lot more understeer, in effect making the car heavier, handling-wise, than a rear-wheel drive car would give you. And that, potentially, of course, this is all just theoretical stuff, but it would give you so much more high-speed control, because the car is being pulled along rather than pushed along. So there's so much more grip and control going to that front end. Now, that is like the gist of my design, basically, and that's still only one of the companies. The other company, or the other dream project for a company, is a much more conventional one. For many years, I've wondered why companies don't make vehicles that look like old cars but actually use modern technology. And I don't mean like the Eagle E-Type, which costs like half a million pounds. That's ridiculous stuff. That's boutique. I'm not talking boutique. I'm talking everyday vehicles that people could afford, which don't necessarily have to be made in an old-fashioned way. They don't need to have wooden frames and old engines and these kind of handcrafted window frames and stuff like that. They just look older. In a similar way to stuff like the Nissan BE1 or the PAL, they look old, but they're not. They're actually modern vehicles. I would love to do that on a bigger scale. And what I would love to do is make a vehicle which looks like the Ford Woodies from back in the day, the big station wagons from the 40s. Make a vehicle that looks like that but has, for instance, like a modern Ford EcoBoost engine in it instead. So you've got this big, gorgeous, wooded out, or at least wood effect, and you could even use real wood. It isn't that expensive, especially once you're using machines instead of handcrafted, and make this really stylish, old-fashioned looking, like, surfer wagon, but with a modern, much more fuel-efficient package underneath the body. Who wouldn't want to have that? I know for a fact that there are plenty of, in particular, older drivers. And I don't mean old people. I mean people who can remember the good old days of cars that would love to have a vehicle which looks and feels like a classic, but which doesn't have all the drawbacks of a classic, like bad fuel economy, bad reliability, incredibly difficult to source parts for if anything goes wrong, and just general upkeep of a classic. Now, of course, that's all part of the experience for classic enthusiasts, but there are so many more people who love the look of classic cars but could never afford one and would still like one. So make a vehicle which looks like a classic and has all of the charm of a classic, but with modern tech, so you could just take it into any Ford dealership and they'd be able to service it as if it was a Focus or a Mondeo or a Fiesta. How cool would that be to have a Ford Woody or like a Cadillac Eldorado, but underneath it's basically just a modern car. You could make the suspension a little bit softer, make the steering a little bit more loose to give it that old school feel, but give it disc brakes instead of drums. Give it that EcoBoost engine so you're getting 40, 50, 60, 70 miles per gallon. Who wouldn't want to buy that? And it wouldn't even need to be like Eagle E-Type or Morgan money. It could be like 30, 40 grand, and people would buy that. People love older cars. So that's a project that I would love to do, but that would be more like a mass production company where you build these old-fashioned vehicles, but using modern methods. I don't understand why people aren't doing that. But that's it overall for my two most prominent ideas, and those are the projects which I would love to do. As I said, probably never will do either of those, and they're totally different ideas. One's kind of practical and for the masses, one's just totally for me and what I want from a car. But, yeah, so as I said, I'd love to hear what you guys would love to create down below. And that's it overall.
so I'll see you guys next week, and as always, thanks for watching.